An HSA, otherwise known as a health savings account, is a type of savings account that allows you to save your pre-tax money in order to pay for qualified medical expenses. In this video, I am discussing seven things that you may be doing wrong with your HSA and what to do instead to maximize your savings. Starting off with a little background on HSAs, HSAs have a triple tax advantage. Number one, contributions that you make to your HSA are tax-free, which means that your contributions can be deducted from your income when you were paying your taxes. And if your employer contributes on your behalf, those contributions are also tax deductible. Number two is your invested funds grow tax-free, meaning whenever you take your money out for qualified medical expenses, you don't have to pay any taxes on the interest, dividends, or growth that those investments accumulate. And number three, qualified distributions are also tax-free. As long as you're using these funds for qualified medical expenses, they are tax-free. And when you turn 65, your HSA actually converts into acting more like an IRA, where funds can be withdrawn from your account for any purchases, not necessarily just medical expenses. However, if you do that when you're 65, you are going to have to pay taxes on any of the interest, growth, or dividends that it accumulates over that time. By using untaxed dollars from your HSA to pay for things like your deductible, your co-insurance, or co-pays, and some other medical expenses, you may be able to lower your out-of-pocket healthcare costs. Qualified expenses can also include smaller things that you might find at the drugstore, including ibuprofen, feminine care products, so tampons, pads, eye drops, contact solution. With all of these tax advantages, I want to make sure that you are using your HSA to its fullest capacity. But that's at here are seven things that you may be doing wrong with your HSA. Number one is using it for non-qualified expenses. Obviously major medical expenses like surgeries, procedures, co-pays, co-insurance, those are all qualified expenses. But the IRS is clear that you are only allowed to use your HSA funds for HSA qualified expenses. So if you're going to a drugstore and you are purchasing contact solution and a bottle of soda at the same time and you pay for the entire transaction with your HSA funds, hypothetically the IRS could come after you and it has happened. Any withdrawal that you make from your HSA account for non-qualified expenses are subject to a 20% tax penalty and they're subject to income tax since you are not using them for qualified medical expenses. This is all true until you reach the age 65 where you can take out and use them to pay for any expenses you just have to pay taxes however the only way you can get around this is if, if you do maybe on accident use those funds towards non-qualified medical expenses if you pay back those funds into the account before that year's tax filing deadline then you can avoid any penalty number two is using an HSA even if you don't qualify for one not everybody qualifies to be able to use an HSA to be eligible to contribute to an HSA you have to have a high deductible health plan so not necessarily necessarily all high deductible health plans qualify you for an HSA, but if you have an HSA, you have to have a high deductible health plan. If you contribute to an HSA without being eligible, whatever you contribute as of 2024 is subject to a 6% tax penalty for every year that it remains in the account while you do not qualify for an HSA. Like I said, not all high deductible health plans qualify for an HSA, so make sure you double check your plan to make sure you qualify. Saving in an HSA is a great start to be saving for future expenses. Something I would argue is even more important is keeping your personal information safe and off the dark web, which is why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura shows me which data brokers are trying to sell my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. When I started using Aura, I found 18 data brokers that were trying to sell my information. Those were people who were trying to make a buck off of something that is obviously very personal to me. I don't want my information out there. Cleaning up my information not only helps me reduce the amount of spam I get, but it also protects me from hackers who could use this information to help access my social media accounts or my bank accounts or any other sensitive information. These data brokers make a fortune off of selling my information, your information to robocallers, spammers, others who want to learn more about you. And legally, these brokers are required to remove your information if you ask them to, but honestly, they make it super difficult to do that, which is why Aura is great because they handle all of that for you. Immediately when I started using Aura, they started started removing my information from those 18 data brokers, many of which I had never heard of before. And if you've been following my channel for any amount of time, you know how important data protection is to me. And it is something I'm very, very passionate about. I 
have had family members who have had their information stolen. It takes a lot of time and effort and money to be able to recover from that. On top of that, stolen personal information can be really, really detrimental to your savings goals if those hackers and spammers can get into your personal bank account information, brokerage account information. Aura is really, really easy to set up. You don't have to have a bunch of different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and a whole lot more. And Aura is offering my viewers a completely free two-week trial. So stop letting other people continue to exploit and profit off of your personal information and go to aura.com slash Adrian Vest to sign up for your free two-week trial. It'll also be linked in the description box below and pinned in the first comment down below. Third thing that you may be doing wrong with your HSA is not investing the funds within your HSA. This is huge, huge, huge. I talk about this all the time when it refers to Roth IRAs or IRAs, it is very, very important for you to be investing the funds within your HSA. Just like in IRAs or Roth IRAs, the money within your account is sitting there unless you invest it. It's not growing. Once you fund your HSA, that money can be invested, but you have to take action on investing the funds within your HSA. Since an HSA is meant to be spent on medical expenses as they come up, once you have a comfortable amount of cushion savings within your HSA, you can start investing the money that you probably don't need. So for example, if you have a deductible of $3,000 and you want to be able to have that much money in your HSA to be able to cover your deductible if something happens, once you have $3,000, anything above that in your HSA, you can invest knowing that you don't need that in case a big medical emergency happens. You would be investing this money as you would in any other retirement account since you probably won't need the money until you are in retirement since an HSA can be used as a retirement fund specifically for medical expenses. And this tip also goes for if you have a Roth IRA or IRA. I hear so, so, so many times that people are funding their Roth IRA or their IRA and just funding it, just putting the money into the Roth IRA or IRA isn't enough. You need to make sure that you are investing it so that it can grow over time. Otherwise, it just sitting there in your Roth IRA is actually going to be losing money because it's not even growing with inflation. Number four is not contributing the right amount for you. For 2024, the max contribution for an individual is 4150. And that includes if your employer contributes on your behalf as well. Once you turn 65 and you start using Medicare, you can no longer contribute to your HSA. And like I said, a good rule of thumb is being able to fund your HSA to be able to cover your deductible. Since an HSA requires a high deductible plan, sometimes reaching your deductible can cost a lot of money and can be a lot if you're trying to cover those expenses out of pocket. You don't have to worry about over contributing to an HSA because since unlike an FSA, you can roll over that money from year to year and it's yours to keep. Unlike an FSA where if you don't use the certain amount of money that you've saved for in that year, then you lose the money. Number five is trashing your receipts. Saving receipts, whether digital or physical, is incredibly important if you are using an HSA, especially for smaller purchases that you would make at a drugstore. If you are paying for any healthcare funds with non HSA funds, so let's say you're using your normal debit or credit card, you can reimburse yourself from your HSA for those purchases. And you can reimburse yourself at any point after you have made those documented expenses. And your distribution will be qualified and therefore it'll be tax free. This is the way I have found using my HSA is most beneficial. And I honestly can't take credit for it. I learned about this from another YouTuber and I thought it was actually just genius because essentially if I'm paying out of pocket for any medical expenses and not using my HSA, I can hold on to those receipts. And in the future, several years down the line that I want to be reimbursed for it, I can go ahead and get reimbursed for medical expenses I made five years ago. But the money that's been in my account has been growing and I'm allowed to take that money out without paying taxes on it in future times. Essentially, it allows your investments to grow, but you're able to reimburse yourself in the future minus inflation for those expenses that you made currently. However, this is only really possible if you're pretty diligent with keeping track of your receipts. I'll link the video of the YouTuber that I saw that, that explained this whole method because he explained the way he tracks his receipts and I thought it was genius, so I'll link it down below. Number six is not naming a beneficiary. Per the IRS, a spouse can inherit an HSA with all of its tax benefits. However, anyone who is not a spouse can inherit an HSA, but non-spousal partner will have to pay 
pay taxes on whatever the HSA's fair market value it is at the time of the transfer. And this information is really important when you're setting up an estate plan or assigning a beneficiary to the account. And number seven is using up all of your funds and not accounting for medical expenses for retirement. The intended use of an HSA is to pay for out-of-pocket medical expenses as they come and not necessarily to save and squirrel away money until retirement although it can be used as an alternative retirement plan. So in order to use this money in retirement, you may consider using your regular income to cover any medical expenses that you have currently so that you can dedicate more of your HSA funds to any medical expenses you have in retirement. All in all, your HSA is there for you to use in whatever method works for you. That may be using all of your funds now or maybe saving all of it for retirement. But figuring out what works for you is incredibly important and making sure you're doing it legally and making the most of all of the tax advantages that it has is incredibly important. If you want to figure out if you're eligible for an HSA, check with your HR department to see if you qualify for a high deductible plan. Don't forget to sign up for your two-week free trial of Aura. Link is down in the description bar. Thank you guys for watching this video and I will catch you in the next one. Bye guys.